The first half of version 4.4 has been pretty nice. We finally got to New Vale, a gorgeous dreamy place with breathtaking views, we got Cloud Retainer and we learned how motherly she actually is, and we joined the Lantern Ride, which was probably too short this year round to be honest, but still very nicely done. These are going to be the topics we are going to cover in this video. As always, this is a theory video. I use information available in the game, but my theories and conclusions are not to be considered the official lore of the game unless I got something right and it's confirmed in a later update of the game itself. With that out of the way and with a lot to talk about, I think it would be best to dive straight into the video, starting with the history of Chen Yu Vale, Fujin's story and an explanation to the murals. The chronology of the events of Chen Yu Vale is a little bit complicated, but I'll do my best. Originally, back when the people were still living in caves, so after the war between the Primordial One and the Second Who came and the Envoy Age, the landscape of Chinyu Vale was completely different and it was entirely ruled by nature. The mountains were barren and the rivers were wild and often overflowed. Back then, the land was ruled by an unnamed gentle god and her three subordinates, the Herb Lord, Ling Yuan and Fu Jin, who was a simple carved swimming in the rivers. Then the people came out of the caves to live on the surface, and these people were the ancestors of the inhabitants of Chenyu Vale, who were able to talk directly to the Emissary of the Heavens through a jade device located in Chinwang Terrace. Of course, the Emissary is the Envoy, so this story takes place during the Envoy Age, the same age in which the ancient civilization of Salvindagnir was thriving. Interestingly, the people of Salvindagnir also erected some kind of monument and they used to go to the summit of the mountain to talk to the heavenly envoys. So could it be that they too had something similar to the device from Chinwan Terrace? Anyway, back to the story, later something happened and the people couldn't talk to the Emissary of the Heavens anymore. What happened is obvious not just because we already know that the Envoy Age ended with the descent of the Celestial Nails, but also because it is quite literally depicted on one of the murals. Since the Envoy stopped guiding humanity, the people of Chenyu Vale started a new tradition, the Rain Jade Rite. Fujin and a group of people, we're gonna talk about them later in the video, went to Chiwan Terrace to throw jade into the river in order to guarantee good weather, prevent the river from flooding and ensure soil fertility. In this era, Fujin also met the other Adepti from Liwe by climbing Mount Atsang and Mount Hulao, but not long after, the Archon War happened. The god of Chin Yu Vale was consumed by the desire to be able to rule the world and decided to fight against Morax, but because she wasn't powerful enough to defeat him, she decided to make the entire Bishui River overflow in an attempt to drown the Middleith, unconcerned about the fact that the flood would have destroyed Chin Yu Vale as well. To stop this disaster, Ling Yuan had her familiars pretend to attack the people of Chinyu Vale in order to herd them toward the shelters that had been prepared for them. Hu Jin went to Chiwan Terrace to throw a votive rain jade in order to open a hole in the riverbed and swallow the excess water, allowing the jade mouth to grow and stop the flooding, while the herb lord fought the god directly. Fujin most likely joined the Herblord in the fight against the Ancient God, but I think Rexlap is joining as well, because it is unlikely that Fujin, the weakest of the Adepti, and the Herblord, who specialized in medicine, could have been able to defeat a god by themselves. Anyway, this fight caused the quote-unquote death of the two Adepti, although death in this case literally means nothing other than losing their powers and their human form, since they are both pretty much alive. The story says that the Herb Lord was cut into pieces and lost all her fingers, meaning she reverted back to her white snake form and later relocated to Liwe, and in case you didn't figure it out, it's Changsheng. While Fujin sank into the river never to surface again, so she reverted back to a car. As for the ancient god, we know that she died in a foreign land, so she most likely fled after being defeated in Chen Yu Vale. In my previous video, I proposed the idea that this god was Orobashi since it fought and lost against Morax and it fled to Inazuma where it died. We now know that the ancient god of Chenyu Vale was a woman, but then again, Orobashi has always been addressed as it, so there is still a slight chance that I was right. With Chen Yu Vale's story out of the way, we do need to talk about the murals and the records of the ancestors that we found at Qishan Wall, because they give us some insight into the ancient past. 
The ancestors of the people of Chen Yu Vale originally lived somewhere else but had to flee while chased by some mountain beasts. They were eventually saved by Ling Yuan, who told them that the Divine Rite was approaching, that the Jade that descended in the past will have to be divided in order to prevent evil beings from obtaining it, and that the people should offer it at Chi Wan Terrace to live at peace. So the people started carving Jade and used it as an offering, hoping that the heavens would respond. A similar rite also used to be performed in the past by their sage ancestors, so probably when the people were still able to talk directly with the heavens, so in the Envoy Age. The last record points directly at the mural on the wall in the cave, painted by the author of the records himself as his last testament, and it is both explanatory and cryptic. We can clearly see that these ancestors were fleeing because a celestial nail came down on their territory. The problem is, where is that place? My first instinctive thought was, well that's the chasm, but something's not right. In the mural we see a big body of water between the two places, but between the chasm and Chin Yu Vale there's only a small lake. Furthermore, around the chasm there's a lot of fertile land that they could have relocated to, like Lisha to the east, so going all the way to Chen Yu Vale, which was barren at the time by the way, makes no sense. So I might be wrong and I might be overthinking this, but could the place where the nail descended be Fontaine? I mean, the place looks elevated, it's colored with blue, and there are curved mountains in Fontaine that look like they were pushed outwards by something powerful landing right in the middle. Also, there has been a celestial nail in every single nation we've visited so far. One in Dragonspine for Mondstadt, one in the Chasm for Liyue, one on Surumi Island for Inazuma, and one in the desert of Adramaveth for Sumeru. So there has to be a nail in Fontaine as well, right? On that note, Ling Yuan talked about a jade that descended in the past, and in Echoes of an Offering, that same jade was said to be able to bring about sweet rain. This honestly makes me think that the jade used in Chen Yu Vale is part of the celestial nail that descended in Fontaine. Another possibility is that the people took apart the huge jade device in Chi Wan Terrace, now useless because the emissaries stopped guiding humanity, and threw its pieces into the river below, meaning that the jade device descended from the heavens. The problem is that it sounded like Ling Yuan wanted this jade to be broken in pieces so that it couldn't be used anymore, while the huge jade device still works. Still, these jade pieces that were used during the Rain Jade Rite are capable of growing and shrinking, and they can terraform an entire land, so either way, it's definitely not normal jade. Anyway, to conclude what I was talking about, if these people fled from Fontaine, they would have had to cross a lake no matter where they went, and Chen Yu Vale is actually the closest place they could have gone to. To be fair, I also considered Natlan because of the fire around the nail, but I highly doubt that they would have crossed the entire desert of Sumeru to reach Chen Yu Vale, and let's remember that the rainforest didn't even exist back then, the entirety of Sumeru was a desert. When it comes to the other three murals, they were painted during the Archon War by the people who took shelter in those caves, and they show a wider section of the history of Chen Yu Vale. The first we need to talk about is the one depicting a group of people, most likely the ancestral inhabitants of the land, among which two are golden, using the huge jade device at Chi Wan Terrace to talk to the emissaries of the heavens during the Envoy Age, so when the heavens still guided humanity. The next mural depicts Fujin sending a votive rain jade into the river from Chi Wan Terrace. This was, as we said earlier, a way to guarantee good weather and produce. Considering that Fujin told us that the ancestral inhabitants of Chen Yu Vale would have considered climbing the sacred mountain a transgression, I think the people accompanying Fujin were the native people of the place, the only ones allowed to perform the ritual alongside her, while the ones we saw in the ancient mural maybe weren't allowed to do so. I mean, it's a sacred mountain, so I suppose that only specific people were allowed to climb it. The last mural is the broken one. Now, what's left of it depicts the land, a lake, and another land in the distance. Because of the color and the position of this land in the distance, I think it represents, again, Fontaine, which is pretty interesting considering what we talked about a few minutes ago. 
In both cases, the color of choice is blue, the color of Hydro. The only difference is that the colors of the recent murals are vibrant, while the ancient ones are muted because of the passage of time. Anyway, in the middle of the mural there used to be a blue circle with two gold outlines, and inside, just like Fujin told us, the people painted her and the herb lord, of which we see her white snake tail. I believe this mural was destroyed by Lingyuan, because she couldn't accept that the people were so happy to be saved that they painted the moment in which both Fujin and Changsheng sacrificed themselves and lost their powers and bodies to achieve that. Now, to end this video, I have 4 small details from the other quests in 4.4 that I want to talk about. First, in Xia Yun's story quest, she told Yuan Dai that if she didn't undo her transformation and revert it back to a white crane, she would have forgotten her life as a human and she would have turned into a creature You're lacking in the ability to even comprehend its own monstrousness. This reminded me about something I talked about in a previous video regarding the Hillichurls and the Curse of the Wilderness. The people of Karya who were transformed became monsters that can't really comprehend their own monstrousness as well, and according to what Dainsela said about Halfdan, How could he have retained self-awareness for 500 years without it? It seems that they were deprived of something which probably caused the transformation. Since there are also other people who had nothing to do with Kanria nor the Cataclysm, like Uko, the scribe from Salvindagnir, who were transformed into those monsters, my theory that their memories were either extracted or deleted is making slightly more sense. If you think about it, when people die in Tevat, their memories go back to the ley lines to be reused, but the Hillichers can die in a normal way and are doomed to live until their bodies simply give up and disappear. If these people had been deprived of their memories, and this was what caused the transformation, then it's obvious that they wouldn't be able to die. They don't have memories that can go back to the ley lines anymore. The second detail comes from the last day of Lantern Ride. We met Furina in Cheyenne Village and despite the fact that she was talking with John Lee, she didn't even remotely recognize him as a Geo Archon. This means that the new Archons never met the original ones after the Cataclysm. Let me elaborate. Nahida couldn't have met them because she had been imprisoned by the Academia, but being the avatar of Ermansoul, she most likely knew who they are and even what they look like. A met the original Arkans in the past when she accompanied Makoto to the gatherings the Arkans used to have with John Lee, but when Makoto died, A gave up on her physical body and hid her consciousness in the Muso Ishin, and the Raiden Shogun most definitely couldn't have cared less about meeting the other Arkans. Venti and John Lee seem to have known the Tsaritsa from before the Cataclysm, especially Venti since he said that they were basically friends, so maybe she used to accompany the original Cryo Archon like A did with Makoto, but then, 500 years ago, things changed and she cut ties with the other Archons, so she wouldn't have attended any gathering anymore. Ignoring the Pyro Archon due to the lack of information about her, the fact that Furina is unaware that John Lee is Rex Lapis means that she never left Fontaine and that she never met the other Archons. Now what does that tell us? If there hasn't been any gathering since the Cataclysm, then maybe what Ganyu said about the new Archons isn't 100% reliable. So maybe she doesn't really know what's happening in Natlan, and she simply gave it for granted that a new Archon had taken Murata's place after the Cataclysm, but neither Ganyu nor any other Archon may have actually met this new God of Fire. This is something that we're going to talk about in my next video, which if you read my posts in the community tab, is going to be all about Natlan. The third detail also comes from the last day of Lantern Ride. Talking about Nevelette, Furina said, If I remember correctly, he's already several thousands of years old. And this hit my brain pretty hard because it reminded me of a theory I had about him back when I was trying to figure him out. Despite his age, Nevelette told us during the Masquerade of the Guilty Archon Quest that he had never met Egeria, which is pretty strange considering that she died only 500 years ago, and then we learned that Fossilor knew exactly where to find him since she sent him an invitation to Fontaine when she became the new Archon. 
Another thing that came to my mind is the fact that in the Velez character details, we were told that no one knows his first name, but just his last name, the Velez, and this has always been in the back of my mind ever since I read it. The name Nevelet is a mix of two French words, Neuve and Villette, meaning New Little Town, and we know from the Song of Stillness that the lone descendant of the dragon Scylla eventually reached a peace agreement with the enemy he was fighting against, and some say that they both betrayed their homelands and built new settlements for exiles. Now, when we talk about exiles in this case, we are basically talking about the golems of Remuria and the humans who oppose the kingdom. Do we perhaps know of a little town that is in Fontaine, but maybe not exactly in the mainland, full of golems lying on the ground? Yes, Petrichor, the town from which the people have a wonderful sight of the Great Waterfall, so it's below the high waters. Furthermore, the name Petrichor, which means perfume of rain on dry land, comes from two Greek words, Petra, which means stone, and Ichor, the blood of the Greek gods. Do you remember how Remus created the golems? He used the Ichor, which is the primordial water that Egeria gave him, and placed it into the immoral stone that he calls Lithos, which is a synonym for Petra, so again, stone. Anyway, if that lone descendant of the dragons was Nevelet, who may or may not be the full dragon prince by the way, it wouldn't surprise me that he didn't want to have anything to do with the people anymore, considering what happened back then. Who knows, maybe we will finally learn what his first name is when we finally get to Petrichor. Although, if I had to take a guess, if he's actually the descendant of the dragon king Scylla, his name may very well be Charybdis or Charybdis, since these are the names of two sea monsters from Greek mythology, and there is actually an island in Fontaine called for Charybdis ruins in the Moht region as well. The fourth and last detail is Menogias. The way they treated Menogias as the adeptus of this year's Lantern Rite was odd. First of all, they never even explained why they picked him in the first place, they didn't even acknowledge them in general, and they insisted a little bit too much about the fact that he was dead. Then the various characters started talking about him out of nowhere and sometimes for no reason at all. Like, do you know how to make a kite shell? No, I don't, but Menogias made wonderful clothes. Huh? What does it even have to do with- Anyway, this all sounded a little bit too odd and sneaky to the point that I'm bringing back the potential theory that Capitano is Menogias. I mean, this is the lantern right before Natlan, we've started to hear a few things about Capitano lately and guess what? This year's Adeptus is Menogias, the one Adeptus who is based on Sun Wukong, a ridiculously strong Asian mythological figure that fought against everybody, even the heavens, winning every time. A mythological figure that, as Ashikai also pointed out, lost a bet with Buddha who sealed him for 500 years in a mountain of rocks, leaving just his head and hands sticking out, so that he could learn patience and humility. Let me highlight that for you. 500 years. And let's be clear about something. In the video that shows the death of the Yakshas, we see Indarias being consumed by karma, Bosatius disappearing, but then we learn how he died in the chasm, and then we just see Menogias attacking Bonanus. We've never seen him die like the others, but even if he did, because John Lee said so, Sun Wukong actually resurrected himself once, so. Furthermore, Capitano is actually very strange. He doesn't seem to have a face. He has more or less the same hairstyle as Menogias, although his hair is black, but his helmet, which is open to the front, seems empty. But even if he has a face and the shadows did a great job at hiding it, Sun Wukong used to wear a hood to hide his face because his ape-like appearance scared the people away. And let's not ignore the elephant in the room, the Liyue -E Geo symbol on Capitano's chest. Does Capitano remind me of the Headless Horseman from Sleepy Hollow? Yes, of course. Is he actually going to be Menogias? Well, if you see a show rerun in either 5.2 or 5.3, then chances are that he actually is. And that's it, I hope you liked the video. If you did, don't forget to leave a thumbs up, and if you're interested in Genshin Impact Theory videos, consider subscribing. 
as I said before, my next video is gonna be about Notland because I have new theories I want to share. And the video after that is going to be about the Archons, the Dragon's Authorities, the Gnosis and the Visions, which is going to be, let's say, controversial. After that, I'm thinking about making a video about my Star Rail characters that I've been building like a madman, you know, just to switch things up a little. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and until next time, over and out.